So I'm giving three talks uh, beginning today um, titled The Promise of Yoga. And um, these talks are an attempt to begin to articulate um, the spiritual significance of yoga for modern practitioners. Um, basically, what I'm going to give you over the course of these three talks is a kind of uh, a, a sketch, a sort of outline, um, some notes, if you like, uh, on an idea uh, of how yoga helps us connect uh, to a spiritual impulse that um, we have become largely alienated from in modern life, or to put it a different way, there are pressures within modern life that tend to alienate us um, from that impulse, that tend to estrange us from it, and uh, tend to make it difficult for us to, to acknowledge it, to feel it, to, uh, to talk about it. And um, I would like to start to articulate uh, an idea uh, about how yoga helps us connect with that impulse and what that impulse is and why it's important to connect with it and um, how we might sort of express uh, our uh, deep longing to be uh, connected to that impulse uh, in the language of contemporary yoga. Uh, so... This is also, of course, a prelude for my 30-week uh, philosophy course called Into the Depths, um, where we take this basic concern and we really uh, turn it every way and we look deeply into it and we try to um, uh, deepen our understanding of old religious, even theological ideas in a way that doesn't sort of bow to the to bow to tradition um, but recognizes tradition as something to as as rich with insight um, something to be honored just in so far as it's rich with insight and we try to go back and and mine some of those insights and yet instead of sort of looking at these ideas as belonging to, different isms or different um, conceptual worldviews. Uh, we try to uh, connect the experiences that they're about uh, to our own experiences and see if we can sort of get a, a conversation going with those, with those traditions and with those ideas, a conversation that really involves our, our own souls. So I thought what I would do here is just talk as I would and into the depths. I mean, usually and in, into the depths, we begin with um, maybe 45 minutes or so um, of me sharing some thoughts about whatever the particular um, theme of the week happens to be. And then we open it up a little for conversation. So I thought we would do precisely that here. And um, we also start with uh, a chant or two. And um, that's how we'll begin now. So we'll start with Sahana Vavatu. And you can sing it along at home, but keep yourself muted. Because <laughs> somehow it doesn't quite sync up. Uh, and um, this is an Upanishadic chant that's just traditionally done before instructional sessions. And it has the uh, distinction of having no esoteric meaning. It just means what it says, and that's really rare in Sanskrit chants. Um, but the translation is, together may we be protected, together may we be nourished, may our studies together be brilliant, um, may our studies have great energy, and may we not unnecessarily oppose one another. Ah uh -huh. Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bunaktu 
Saha viryam karava vahai Tejas tamas tu Mavid vishavahai Aham shanti 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 hi. And then let's take a moment just to sit together and bring awareness into the body. And what we might do is bring the attention down to the center of the chest, right down into the heart, into the seat of our natural kindness and generosity. And we'll breathe into and out of that space. So as we breathe in, we'll visualize the breath moving into the center of the heart, drawing closer and closer and closer to a center that we never totally reach, and then exhaling from that center outward and letting the natural warmth of the heart spread itself out through the body and indeed beyond the body throughout our sensory fields into the space that surrounds us. And letting all the sensations of the body then move in and out with the breath. And holding them all in an open space of awareness so that we bring everything that we feel to the act of listening. And the idea is that we're allowing ourselves to connect with a sense of being heart-centered, of our awareness being heart-centered so that when we think through difficult things, we allow ourselves to be guided by the heart. We allow the thinking mind to be guided by the heart. So that we're connected to a natural wisdom. Connected with what the body knows beyond what can be expressed verbally. Now to begin to focus our thoughts. I would like to introduce another chant that comes from the Sanskrit poet, Bhartrahari. And then we're gonna look closely at the chant and think about what it implies for the spiritual impulse itself. So the translation of this chant, before I tell you in Sanskrit, is as follows. I was you, and you were me, and thus it was that once we were one. But what has happened now by which you are you and I am I? So I'll say that again for those of you who haven't encountered this verse before. I was you and you were me. And thus it was that once we were one. 
But what has happened now by which you are you and I am I? And now I'll chant it for you a few times in Sanskrit. Ah. Yum vayam vahiyam yuyam Ityasin matirahavayo Kim jatam madunayena Yuyam yuyam vahiyam vayam So we're going to take this chant decontextualized. Right? In other words, we're going to take it without sort of being lifted from its narrative context. Right? And then ask yourself, who is the speaker of the chant? Whose voice is that? And first, you might imagine, you notice that the chant is saying it's, it's sort of, it's, it's expressing some kind of astonishment, some kind of wonder, right? At being somehow disconnected, being pulled apart from some other being, a being that, it, that the, the voice of the chant uh, seems to assume uh, can hear, what's being said, right? In other words, whoever's speaking this chant thinks that the one from whom he or she is estranged can hear what's being said. Indeed, the, the chant itself is addressed to the one from whom the chanter is estranged. And it's saying, what happened? Once upon a time, we were together as one. And what happened that pulled us apart? What happened that suddenly gave us this sense of being so fundamentally separate and perhaps even isolated from one another, right? So that kind of astonishment that's being expressed by the chant, you can, imagine, you can imagine different voices, different characters giving voice to this idea. So, you know, I mean, maybe the first thing that comes to mind is the sort of, um, that sense of astonishment that is sometimes, uh, you know, felt at the dissolution of, a sort of early, maybe teenage love, right? Because the first time you fall in love, you'll remember, you have this sense that you've come home to the one with whom you belong, right? Teenagers falling in love for the first time often have the feeling that the one that they are in love with is the only one that they could ever love. Right, that somehow this one that they've fallen in love with was, you know, made by some divine force specifically um, for you, right? And um, you know, there's an old, in fact, there's an old uh, Greek myth which is given voice uh, in uh, Plato's Symposium that tries to capture uh, that very sentiment uh, in the Symposium. The, play, the, the playwright Aristophanes uh, tells this myth um, about the, the longing of Eros. And according to this myth, there was once upon a time uh, these beings uh, who were, there's sort of like two beings in one, you know, two minds sort of, and they were, and they were stuck together, you know, so there could be there could be, uh, and, and some of them were hermaphroditic. So there could be a male and a female, and they were stuck together. 
uh, and and sort of like Siamese twins, I guess. Uh, and then sometimes there were two males stuck together, and sometimes there were two females stuck together. So it's a very you know, progressive idea. And they were in love, you know, and they would they would sort of roll around. They were rounded, and they had eight, they have four legs and four arms, and so they would roll around together. Uh, and they ha were having so much fun being continuously, sensually entangled with one another that the gods became jealous. Yeah, and so Zeus threw some thunderbolts down from Mount Olympus and struck these beings in half and split them in two. Yeah. And those beings are human beings, <laughs> beings who now go wandering the face of the earth looking for their counterpart, looking for the one with whom they were once um, originally uh, unified. Yeah. So there is this feeling implicit in love, especially love in its sort of early life stages, romantic love, right, in which one often has the experience of finally finding the one that one was meant to find. And it goes with this sense that, you know, there is no other for me. And, you know, I, I finally found my true love and she's found me. And it feels so right when we embrace one another that it's unimaginable that we would ever be apart. Yeah, that's the idea. Um, you know, but then a week or two passes and, um, the beloved is dating your best friend, you know, uh, and you know what that sort of teenage heartbreak is like, you know, it's absolutely devastating and it goes with a sense of astonishment, like a shock, right? It's not just sadness or sorrow. It's a shock like a sort of like you can't wrap your head around it. You can't believe that it happened because in the moment that you were together, you were sure that it would never be possible for you to be apart, right? So you can imagine this sort of, you know, young, forlorn, and yet shocked, recently estranged teenage lover speaking these words, the words that are in, our, in, a, in the Yu Yam Vayam chant, to express this kind of astonishment at being recently estranged from the beloved. But another context in which you can imagine uh, this sentiment needing voice is that of a very small child who's just beginning to recognize his independence, existential independence from the mother, right? And if you can think back as to what that was like, because of course it wasn't probably not something that happened all in a flash, although you can probably remember some sort of key moments, you know, where you perhaps began to conceptualize it for yourself. But it's something that happens very slowly over the course of, you know, many years. Um, a sort of slow, gradual realization that, that one is indeed a separate being from the mother and that the mother is indeed a separate being from oneself, right? And that the mother is vulnerable, the mother is limited, right? The mother is one among many, right? And that the mother therefore is not the world itself. But of course, to a very young child, the mother is the world. The mother is everything. The mother is at the heart of the world, right? The mother is, I mean, to, a, to an infant, let's say, right? Or to a toddler. The world itself is unimaginable without the mother, right? And you can even go back and recall the, the, the sort of moment of, take the moment of birth itself, right? That prior to that moment, one is floating 
in the primordial waters of the womb with absolutely no sense of separation between oneself and the basic sources of one's nourishment and support, right? Because what supports one, what nourishes one is one's, it's like you're swimming in it, right? You're, and you're so fully immersed in it and have never experienced yourself not being immersed in it that you don't even have a thought about it, right? There's no sense of yourself yet as being distinct from what you need in order to survive. But then that traumatic rupture of birth in that moment when you're pushed down the birth canal and you emerge into the light of the world, you come into a world of edges. You come into a world of distances. You come into a world where you suddenly need to negotiate treacherous circumstances in order to procure your basic nourishment and support. Now, of course, you don't realize that in the moment that you come out. You don't have the conceptual ability for it, right? But nonetheless, you're experiencing that reality, and it's so traumatic, right, that some sort of benign, merciful force within us makes us forget that moment. But you instinctually turn and crawl up the belly of the mother. Right? That is, if, if you're not in a modern hospital where they grab you and <laughs> take cold steel instruments and start working on you right away. Right? But if left, to your, if left to for things to run their course, the baby turns and crawls up the belly of the mother as if it understands that the body of the mother is the womb turned inside out. And so the baby crawls upward toward the heart of the mother, toward the bosom, where it can be protected, warmed, nourished, right? And that's one's world, right? in the beginning. And then slowly, you know, over the next, you know, over several years, I mean, it's interesting to think, isn't it? How difficult it is to say exactly when that transition happens, you know. Um, because it seems to sort of happen in stages, you know. And I can think of some people who are even older than me who seem not to have fully come to this realization yet. They seem to be all men too. I don't know what to make of that, but uh, in any case, we'll leave that one alone. Um, but there is a sense, if you can remember it, you know, if you think back about it, if you think back to, if you can think back to m maybe moments where you crossed a certain threshold of consciousness, you know, where you had the distinct feeling that something had shifted and you were more separate from, more sort of distinct from your mother than ever before, right? And probably you have many such episodes throughout your life, right? And often they really do come, but especially in those early years, you know, when you're, I don't know, six or something like that. They can really come with a sense of astonishment, you know, of true surprise, of true bewilderment, right? And perhaps um, also of wonder at recognizing your existential distinction from, from the mother. And so you can imagine then that the sentiment of a young person who's beginning to have that gradual realization of one's own ontological independence 
being expressed by this chant. Yeah. So that's a second kind of voice, the voice of the child realizing its difference from the mother. You can imagine that that voice is being expressed by this chant. Yeah. You with me? So a third kind of context in which you can imagine this voice capturing a particular sentiment is the, the spiritual seeker who has had an intimation of the divine presence, a spiritual seeker who has had an experience of profound, deep, interconnection with all beings and through all beings to the creative source of being, who's had an experience, in other words, of standing impossibly close to that source, of recognizing the presence of that source within one's own experience, and in that recognition feeling as if one was simply remembering something that one had forgotten. And now if you, you know, in order to really hear me here, you need to imagine your own experience. Don't, don't put it to yourself in the third person, but think of those moments that you've had in which you feel a profound mysterious continuity with all other beings a sort of deep community a spiritual communion if you like with all living things or in which you felt that the source of your being was standing within you and aware of your every experience and supporting and sustaining all of that experience effortlessly. And wasn't it the case, or isn't it the case, that in that recognition, you feel as if you're remembering something rather than learning something new? You feel as if you're remembering something that you'd somehow forgotten when you're in attention was pulled outward into the world of edges, when your attention was pulled into the wonderful distraction of ordinary life, or perhaps by some traumatic or painful event, you were pulled out of your own heart. And yet, what you remember in those moments and what you recognize in those moments seems so, so simple, so obvious, so overwhelmingly apparent that you suppose that you'll never forget it again that it will be with you always.
that you'll hold that awareness and bring it with you for the rest of your life. And indeed, there's a sense in which you do because you, could, you couldn't you could possibly do other. And yet, there's the experience, the 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 antecedent experience of realizing that one has been distracted once again, of realizing that one has perhaps forgotten once again. And that might go, as it often does, with a feeling of estrangement, a profound feeling of painful disconnection from that creative source of one's being. And thinking back to what that experience was like, that it had that sense, that feeling of memory to it, one might feel astonished and bewildered at one's own distraction, astonished and bewildered that one forgot once again. And so that's a sort of third, a third character, right? That a third voice, if you like, that might, and even if you, a third sentiment that might be expressed by this chant, right? So we have these three voices or these three sentiments, the sentiment of the teenage lover who's just lost the beloved, the sentiment of the very young child who's realizing his existential independence from the mother, or the spiritual seeker who, after having an experience of profound intimacy with divine presence, suddenly finds herself having an experience of being on the outside. And what I would like to suggest is that these three sentiments, these three voices, are all deeply connected. That there's an archetypal experience of intimacy and estrangement, a movement, a dynamic, even an alternation between intimacy and estrangement that can be felt on these different levels. Now, of course, the, the connection between, I think, these three voices is not difficult to see. Right? I mean, one way of making it out is to, you know, to remind ourselves that we all, just by virtue of being born, right, are thrust into the experience of having to slowly realize our existential independence from the mother, right? And that that very naturally goes with a sense of loss, right? Not that there's something inherently regrettable about it, right? It's part of maturation after all, right? And it's, but it, it's one of the very early stages of the, you know, ascent of the soul or the, the, the journey of the soul through this life is to realize that 
independence. And, you know, it's that that sort of the, the way that teenagers, as they're first starting to relate to their feelings of desire for others, the way that they grasp at one another, right? That the way that teenage love has that very kind of possessive, jealous kind of character to it, usually, right? Can be seen, can't it? Not, not just can it be seen, but doesn't it? It's almost like it has to be seen against the background of this experience of birth and this gradual realization you know, of one's independence from the mother, right? That if you didn't understand that everybody goes through that experience, you might not really be able to relate as perceptively with genuine human understanding to that teenage experience of longing for intimacy with another human being. And as for the connection of the spiritual seeker to the voice of the young child, we might just remind ourselves that perhaps the oldest mythological trope in human history is of the mother goddess. The oldest instances of human art express already this mythological theme. And it seems to be not just the oldest, but perhaps the most widely and continually, repeatedly expressed mythological trope in human history. So it's, it's deeply embedded in our consciousness. And it's the idea that the world itself is the body of the goddess. And that idea is simply the reversal of the early childhood idea that the mother is the world. You see? The child thinks that the mother is the cosmos. The mother is the universe. The mother is everything, right? And then a more sort of matured spiritual consciousness right? often inverts that idea to seeing the world as the mother. But it's precisely that idea, this idea that the world is enchanted in that way, right? This idea that the world is the, is the is the body of the goddess, right? That idea is also an idea from which we've been most certainly estranged through certain historical developments that have at least something to do, something to do with the rise of modern science. Okay. You know, at the end of the 15th century, when Columbus arrived in South America, when he saw land, he 
tasted the water, and took a sample and noticed that it was rather brackish. It was not terribly salty. And so he understood that he must be near a river mouth, right? And he thought that he must be then somewhere near the South Pole, right? Now Columbus had, let me back up. Columbus, Dante, envisioning creation, tells a story according to which the dark angel, Satan, is cast out of heaven by the hand of God right into the top of the earth and on into the center of the earth with such force that it blew a mountain out the other side. And that other side was the South Pole, okay? And the mountain that was created there on the South Pole is the Purgatorial Mountain. And on top of that mountain was the Garden of Paradise. And from that garden flowed three rivers, right? all the way down the mountain. Now, when Columbus got to, you know, what's now called South America, and he realized that the water was sort of brackish, not terribly salty, he thought, I must be near one of those rivers. I must be near the Purgatorio Mountain, right? I mean, this, this is something that he, that, he, that he writes in his travel diary, right? Columbus, he was quite educated. Uh, and he turned and went north, you know? And apparently they didn't understand so much about the, the jet stream uh, currents. Because as he went north, he thought, wow, I'm really picking up speed now, sailing north. And he reasoned that he must be sailing downhill. <laughs> sailing down from this, you know, basically he thought he was on the slopes of the Purgatorial Mountain, you know? going northward and picking up speed because the rivers were flowing down, right? Now, it's a wonderful example of how, for an educated person at the end of the 15th century, and everything was about to change, of course, right? In the next hundred years, everything would change, right? But in that moment, it's a good example of the way that a particular mythological idea that connected humanity to the divine structured the way that one saw reality, right? Completely determined what one thought one was looking at, right? That that myth itself, a myth which again connects humans to the divine, right? gave one one's basic sense of where one was and what one was looking at. And, of course, over the next several uh, hundred years, all of those, those various myths that were taken to be, um, you know, those myths that structured our perception of the external world were slowly dismantled uh, by, you know, better observation right? With the understanding of the jet stream current, by the realization that the South Pole actually doesn't really have a mountain on it, uh, by the, you know, um, by the demise of the, of the geocentric model of the of the of, of what we now call our solar system. They didn't call it that, of the cosmos, right? This understanding that the, actually the earth revolves around the sun rather than the other way around. Uh, and by the realization, uh, the, the sort of realizations concerning biological evolution uh, of especially the late 19th century, you know, all of these slowly dismantled 
this body of myth that we once had that connected us to the divine presence, a body of myth that we shared, right? Such that the world that now comes into view for us as the world that we all sort of agree to live in, the world that uh, is the, the sort of public world, the world that we share, right, is a world that science itself brings into view. And that world has no divine presence in it whatsoever, right? At least the story that's told about that world makes no essential reference to any divine being or divine presence or divine force, even if, as is in fact, of course, the case, people can't seem to shake off right, their basic sense that that there is divine presence and that it's reaching its hand out to us. But what I'm suggesting, the reason I'm presenting this to you is because it seems obvious to me that one of our, one of the basic facts about our situation, and I, I think uh, the, especially the situation of many people who are practitioners of contemporary yoga, is that we come to yoga with a feeling of being estranged from the creative source of our being, but without actually being able to articulate that fact to ourselves. So in other words, we come to yoga with a sense of being isolated, being alone, right? The evidence for that is, of course, the pharmacological data, right? According to which some two thirds of Europeans and Americans are on medication for depression and anxiety, right? And depression, of course, goes with a feeling of being isolated within oneself, right? And so, you know, we clearly have this sense of sort of being, being you know, desperately alone, um, of being sort of disconnected from something that would make our lives more meaningful. And most of us don't seem to find a whole lot of consolation in the traditional offerings of religion, right? Because, you know, not only because they seem so outdated, they seem so anti-progressive, they, they can seem so sort of stuck in their ways, but also because so many of us have been, were tormented and brutalized at a very young age by people who are using these ideas to assert, you know, their authority and to, you know, to, uh, to control and manipulate us uh, in ways that we eventually had to throw off, right? And so many of us then find ourselves with a certain distaste even um, for religious ideas, traditional religious ideas. And I think, you know, I think a lot of people in Europe and in the US and, you know, other kind of related places where there's a similar experience, um, will come to something like yoga and be interested in Eastern spiritual ideas precisely because, not simply because, okay, but pointedly because there's no past experience of having someone abuse one with those ideas. <laughs> you know, there's, no, there's no sort of past trauma, right, um, that, that one has uh, where someone was using those Eastern ideas to manipulate and control one. Although the case is exactly the reverse I found um, for many people who are coming to yoga, you know, from India, for example, right? I mean, if you want to know why it is 
that India, it's that yoga has been so slow to catch on in India, uh, even after this sort of explosion um, of global yoga that's been happening since I don't know the 1950s. It probably has something to do with this sort of simple fact about one's about one's upbringing, yeah. So, um, myths are intent. They, they they play a certain role in human life, and they play a certain role uh, in human consciousness, which is helping us to deal with certain existential problems, certain basic existential problems, right? This is what myths, this is one of the functions of myth. Now, it used to be that myths were also sort of bound up in various factual descriptions about the world, like the one that we just considered with Columbus, and this idea that you know, God created the purgatorial mountain by casting Satan into the center of the earth and it lies on the South Pole and so forth, right? And so with the, with the realization that that's not actually the way that the empirical world works, a lot of those myths have been discarded, right? But nothing has stepped in to fill the emptiness that's created when those myths are uprooted from the soil of our hearts and we're suddenly left to just find our own way in terms of finding a meaningful existence as in terms of, of, of finding a way of living that, um, you know, in which we feel like we are, meaningfully engaged and and beyond that far beyond that that we are in deep communion with other with the beings with whom we share this plane and i would say in deep communion with the source of the creative forces that make us who we are the source of the creative forces that make our hearts beat that make our sensations move across our sensory fields and make our thoughts turn. The forces that give us our creative spark, the forces that kindle the flame of our higher desires, those, the source of those forces is something that we have to relate to. And insofar as we fail to relate to that thing, we find ourselves alienated confused, estranged in that old sense. So what I want to suggest, and I'm going to, I'm going to set this down now because we've been, I've been going on for about an hour, but I'm going to pick up there later. But just to summarize and set it down, I'm suggesting that we do indeed have inside of us a deep, unshakable, desire for intimacy with the creative source of our being and that we sometimes recoil from that impulse because we don't know how to place it. We don't know how to speak of it in a way that doesn't seem to imply all kinds of you know, to have all kinds of metaphysical consequences that we don't know what to do with. Or maybe that seems to... Um, just a second, I'm going to... Let's see if I can mute everybody. I forget how to do that. Oops. Come here. Who's talking to their dog? Whoever that is, can, can you... Can you mute yourself? It's super sweet, actually. But, um. It sounds like it's Julie, Julie Edmonds. Is it Julie? Yeah, yeah, it just keeps the hook. If keeps you would, down. dear. Yeah, it's Julie Edmonds. Ha! Did, is she hearing you? I don't know. Hi, Julie.
Okay, well, she's quiet now anyway, so all good. Um, so we have this impulse inside of us to be connected to, let's say, to the source of our creativity. And indeed, if you think about it, it's, some, it's essential to human life that's, that you, you have to relate to that, right? And then not just the, the creativity by which you sort of come into your own as an artist, because that's not for everybody. Everyone's not like everyone's kind of, you know, cast in that way. But living human life involves creativity. It is a creative act, right? To really come alive and to thrive you have to be creative in relationship. You have to be creative in the way that you conceive of yourself in your various situations, in the way that you imagine what it is that's actually happening to you, in the way that you tell your stories, right? If you don't have that creativity and you have the sense that life is just happening to you or that these stories are being forced upon you, that's depression, right? But to come out of that and have the feeling that you know that 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 there's some artistry involved here right and that there's some some creative force that's sort of welling up in you and spilling out and that you can generously share that with the people around you that's what really brings you alive right and so it's something that whoever you are and whatever you do you have to relate to that you have to relate to your own creative vitality Right? And indeed, that it's the same vitality uh, that is responsible for your health. So you, you having having a a relationship with that, a functional, engaged, balanced, deep, enriching relationship with that is essential to human thriving. And yet, it's the very thing that when we don't, if we don't know how to talk about spirituality, if we don't know, you know, if we're, you know, if we've had enough of metaphysical ideas, we've had enough of philosophy, we've had enough of theology, right? And we've had enough of sort of what we feel is maybe even a sort of dogmatism in sort of ethical approaches to these things that is a kind of dogmatic or or if we've tried some of these surrogate interpretations of spirituality which you have in Christianity you go like the, the sort of progressive movement in Catholicism which you have in Buddhism especially in its kind of Tibetan and variation as it's been imported into the West where spirituality is, you know, they reassure you that you don't have to believe anything. And I'm not telling you you have to believe anything. I actually think you don't. But there's one approach to this, which they say, you don't have to believe anything. You just have to act a certain way, right? It's about, you know, that, that you know, spiritual, spiritual life is about communing with your fellow beings, you know, in a certain, in a certain way, you know, according to a certain code. And then you have to sort of, you know, devote yourself to social progress and so on. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a very, that's a strong idea these days, you know? Um, and, you know, it's not an altogether bad idea, but it's, it tries out of, it tries out of exasperation for the old metaphysical models, you know, the models that were sort of based on Hellenic ideas where you, where in other words, based on, you know, I, ideas where the divine presence is like a thing that you relate to. And then you have to believe that there's this thing, the divine presence, and you have to relate to that. It's like, it implies some kind of metaphysical picture of reality. And you think, well, look, you know, I'm too well educated to go that route Therefore, my religion, my spirituality is all ethical. You see what I mean? That's a, that's a very powerful movement and has been for the last hundred years, not just in Christianity, but even in the way that Buddhism's been brought into the West. And you see it in other forms of spirituality too, right? 
what I'm suggesting here, and I'm, I'm really biting off more than I can constructively talk about in this moment, but I like to do that. Um, but you know, what's missing there in those approaches is precisely this invitation to engage on an individual level with your own creative vitality, with your own, that is with the source of creative energy inside you, right? And those approaches are, are typically sort of suspicious of that kind of, you know, that, 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 that kind of leaning and they discourage it. But yoga does not. Yoga fully encourages you to feel into the body, you know, into the body as the site, the source, the manifestation of that creative energy and to get to know it and to relate to it as it presents in the language of, in the language of sensation, in the language of dreams, right? In the, in the language of breath, right? Rather than in, in concepts and in, in verbal ideas and metaphysical ideas. And so I find that terribly exciting. And, for, and I will explore that idea further uh, over the next two weeks uh, in this little talk series. So thank you so much for listening. <laughs>